Candy, thank you. Uh, it's uh, a delight to be here in St. Louis. Uh, I know St. Louis very well. I know Missouri very well. I'm a University of Missouri grad, a proud Missouri grad from 1984. So applause for those of us who are Tigers. I left uh, Southern California, San Diego, where I grew up, to come to the University of Missouri to uh, be a, school, a student at the School of Journalism, and it uh, made all the difference in my life, so I'm very happy to be here in St. Louis and very, very happy to be with you. Uh, Candy, that was kind of a curveball you threw to me right there, that whole idea about a speech about how we're going to work together and compromise and consultation after the election. Uh, I didn't know that was what I was brought here to talk about because now I'm really afraid I have no remarks to offer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but let me try to give you a sense or my sense of where I think Washington and those who operate at the national political level are, and I will do it by means of a story. The story about a trial that is going on, very early stages of a trial, and a prosecuting attorney calls the first witness, and she's an elderly, grandmotherly lady, and the attorney walks up and says, um, Ms. Walker, do you know me? She says, oh, yes, I do. I do know you, Mr. Bradley. I've known you since you were a child, and knowing you since you were a child, I must tell you, you're a horrible disappointment to me. You lie all the time. You cheat on your wife. You're a terrible attorney who constantly plea bargains cases just to prop up your ratio of prosecutions. Before you came back to our state after that fancy law school you went to, you were brought up on ethics charges almost everywhere you were. I know who you are. Prosecuting attorney kind of reels. He says, uh, well, uh, do, do you know the defense attorney? He says, oh yes, I know him too. I used to babysit for him when he was a child. I know his parents very well. I must tell you, he's kind of a disappointment to me also. He's a bigot, he drinks all the time. He's a terrible defense attorney, unlike his father who was a great defense attorney, he does almost no pro bono work, and the cases he does take on, he usually loses because he usually sleeps through the trials. I must tell you, he's also a huge disappointment to me. Well, a heavy, heavy silence has now fallen over the courtroom, and these two reeling attorneys are sort of wondering what's going to happen next. Then comes the ear-piercing slam of the gavel, and the judge calls the two attorneys up to the bench and he says, if either one of you asks that woman who I am, I'm going to jail you for contempt. <laughs> that is my way of suggesting that those who operate at the highest levels of national politics are held in what used to be charitably called minimum high regard. Look. The approval rating for Congress right now as an institution is at its lowest level in American history. I don't need to tell you that, but just to quantify it, it's in the low, well, I was going to say teens, but it's lower than the teens, 11 or 12, generally speaking. The president, though liked and trusted, has an approval rating in the high 40s, but there was an interesting statistic today uh, in the most recent Gallup USA Today poll. And it was an interesting question asking if Mitt Romney or Barack Obama would be a good president in the next four years. And both had the same score, 13%. Now, John McCain and then Senator Obama got 25% on that scale in 2008. Now, I don't need to tell you, President Obama is the president. And he scores in this national Gallup poll almost less than half than he did as when he wasn't president. So he's taken a hit. All of our national politics has taken a hit. And I wrote a column last summer about Congress, but it was also a large, sort of a larger observation on Washington. And uh, the column had a clever headline, Congress Gone Mad. And what was infuriating me at the time was what I said at the time struck me as an acceptance of mediocrity and minimalism and our federal legislature, and I bring the president involved in this because presidents can and do make a huge difference as to what a Congress does or doesn't do, can apply pressures. Well, this was right after the whole fiasco with the debt ceiling, and Congress could not decide if it was going to continue funding, immediate funding for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Now, at this time, there was about seven or eight weeks where funding was completely held in abeyance, and almost Literally, if you were not as a disaster victim somewhere in our country, 
bleeding from your eyes or ears, and in massive, visible, instantaneous distress, you got no money from the federal government to assist you in any way because there was no funding, because Congress couldn't agree. And I said to myself, look, we have now reached a stage in our legislative life in America where when we keep the government operating, that's something to celebrate. Not something that's supposed to happen as a matter of course, but no, that's kind of an accomplishment. Hey, we didn't shut the government down this year. Aren't we grand? Aren't we glorious? Or when we avoid a debt ceiling crisis, that is to say for the first time in our history, genuinely and intentionally jeopardize the full faith and credit of the United States by avoiding a debt ceiling crisis, that also falls, roughly speaking, into the category of accomplishment. Well, these did not feel to me, they do not feel to me like accomplishments. They feel like Congress taking us up to brinks that don't have to exist and then patting themselves on the back either when they just avoid the brink or create such instability and fear and anxiety that they look slightly better than they did otherwise. And the federal emergency management funding fight seemed to typify this to me tremendously. And I know in your work, in your world, it's not just disasters, it's the daily attempt to meet the needs of those most in need that concerns you. And the federal government does play a role in that. But when the federal government is indifferent or inactive in taking on larger structural things that it used to do as a matter of course and would consider it not an accomplishment, but just doing its hour to hour, day by day, month by month job, when that kind of dedication to duty slips away and you find yourself in a situation where even crises and, their, and the, the process of averting them becomes something to celebrate, I think things have gotten askew. Now, We have something that you may have heard about called the fiscal cliff. Let me tell you a quick little story uh, about the fiscal cliff. I wrote a column about five or six months ago where I described all of the very important fiscal tax policy and other policy decisions that I knew Congress was going to save for the lame duck Congress. And I wrote a column and I listed them all and I said, look, this could have according to economists I've talked to, a two or three percentage point effect in a negative sense on our national economic growth. And I gave the column a headline, the lame duck session from hell. I thought that was kind of clever. <laughs> I'm a wordsmith. You read in the little pamphlets you have that I left television to go back to playing and toying with words, and I was actually very proud of myself. Well, I don't need to tell you that uh, Pride goeth before the fall. So about two weeks later, Ben Bernanke, one of America's great literary geniuses, <laughs> an inspired writer whom we all turn the pages of the Beige Book because it's just so full of Federal Reserve literary flourishes, <laughs> testifies before Congress and gives my lame duck from hell a different name. He calls it the fiscal cliff and it becomes the instantaneous soundbite hit of the century. Do you have any idea how demoralizing it is <laughs> to be outwritten by Ben Bernanke? <laughs> All right, the fiscal cliff approaches us. Um, let me uh, give a description of what I think is behind the fiscal cliff by means of another story. Uh, this joke is originally one uh, with ethnic flavoring. Uh, I know there's sensitivity to ethnic flavor jokes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to personalize all the three characters uh, in this joke so there is no possibility, uh, though it was remote to begin with, of offense. All right, there's a Southern Californian, a Swede, that's my ethnic heritage, and a Missouri grad, all right? I got all the bases covered, folks. And they're all construction workers working on a very high-rise project, about 80 floors. And one day, they're all sitting there at their lunch hour, and they open a lunchbox. And the Missouri grad says, meatloaf. Meatloaf again. If I get meatloaf in this lunchbox one more time, I'm jumping off this building. That's the Missouri grad, okay? The Swede opens up his lunchbox and says, blood sausage. 
Oh my God, blood sausage. If I get blood sausage in my lunchbox one more time, I'm gonna jump off this building. 